before you even use a chart, it's important to understand what type of data you're working with, right? Because that's going to drive what type of chart that we use. So I've laid out a couple of examples here. These are all different types of data, and I'll show you what I mean. This first table that we have, these are all made up tables, but what this is is if you were to sample a population of let's say 769 trees, there would be this many of each type. So there's certain charts that make sense for this because what this is, each of these pieces of data is a part of the whole. So 345 by itself doesn't mean anything. But if you see 345 as part of this entire picture, then you understand what the data means. So if you have a relationship like this, which we're calling part to whole, there are a few different types of charts that you would use. So what we're going to do, let's highlight this table. And you go to insert chart. Google Sheets is going to guess what type of chart you want based on the data that it sees. And that's actually picked one of the examples I was going to talk about. So, so you're seeing those data points in relation to all of the others and that they make up a whole. This type of data can be best shown as a pie chart that you're seeing there. And there's different types of pie charts. So you could do what's called a donut chart, which is pie chart with a hole in the middle, and you could put some data in the middle of it. And we'll go more in depth with each of these types of charts in different videos. Right now, the point is just to show you the options or you could do just a 3D pie chart. All right, so all three of those are showing the composition of what's in this 769. All right, so let's delete this chart. We'll move on to the next type. I've kept the theme of trees here, but I've made this list average tree height. So why we chose that is because the 107 inches, we'll say, say millimeters, wherever you are, I guess that'd be a really small tree, but we'll say centimeters. Um, meters? Let's do meters. This 107 is totally meaningful by itself, and it has nothing to do with the 62 or the 99. So each one of these data sets is whole in and of itself. So we'll call it whole to whole. And if we want to look at the type of chart for this, let's highlight this table. You see, you can grab the header row if you want. You don't need to. We'll just uh, highlight E5 through F8. And this time, let's do something different. Instead of going to insert chart, we'll use another feature that's in Google Sheets that I almost never use because it doesn't seem to guess what I'm trying to do correctly. But in this case, when I was putting these together, I noticed it was spot on almost every time. You'll see at the end, it doesn't do it. But what we're going to do is we're going to go down in the lower right-hand corner, and we're going to left click on Explore. All right, and Explore suggests these different chart types. Let's just pick the bar chart for now. We'll just left click it, drag it onto here. And what this chart does is it, this chart can easily symbolize different data points and they do relate to each other in this chart. You can see which one's largest, but they're not shown as part of a whole. So this bar chart is a great way to show this data. You can also do a line chart. So we'll drag this here. I don't think this is the best option for this because it looks like it's showing you a trend rather than four separate points. But depending on what you're doing, it might work well. Let's get rid of that line chart for now. And as I hover over each one of these charts, you'll see that different things happen. So it will show you how many sycamore are in this sample. And if you left click on these three dots, you can edit the chart. We'll go into all these different options when we talk about specific chart types. But for now, just know that these are here. And if you want to change something, it's pretty easy with all these settings. All right, we'll delete that. We'll move on to the third type of chart. So a lot of data that you have is going to be based on dates, right? And the dates mean something. So you might want to see, oh, I'm going to close this. It's giving it away. You might want to see the relationship of each of these pieces of data over time to see what's happening to them. So if you were to graph just 2021, you probably wouldn't want this type of chart. But if you want to capture, so if you want to capture all five of these, we'll call this a time series. So it's showing these data points over time. And we want to choose something that can illustrate the effect of time on these data points. So let's go back to using the Explore option. And it gives you a few different choices. One of them is a series of bar charts over time. 
and a series of line charts. Let's do the line charts. I think that I'm um, showing this the best myself. So this line chart made some choices for you. It decided to put the types of tree on the top, the time on the x-axis, and the growth of the tree on the left. This makes charts far easier to use than they used to be. So when you used to build a chart, you had to know where to put all these data points. It was like taking a high school math class all over again. So Google Sheets is doing a lot of this thinking for you. It presents the chart and then you just customize some things. So in this case, maybe we want to change the title. So let's just double left click on the title. It's that easy. And we'll just say growth over time. All right, so there's some other options that you can use to show a time series. One of them are these bar charts. But a good way to see some other ones is just to select the data again and see what it gives you. So in this case, it gave us what it's calling a column chart. And this shows it pretty well too. I personally find this one to be harder to look at, right? So if you wanna see maple compared to oak, you can see that by going through it, but if you see the lines, it's just smoother. So all of this is going to depend on your audience, how technical they are, how it's presented. If it's something where you're just going to talk about it briefly and it's in a slide, make it simple. If it's something that you're going to publish, someone's going to have it in their hands, they can look as long as they want, you can make it more complicated. All right, so let's move on to the fourth type of data that you can have, if I can learn how to scroll. Let me clean this up a little bit. All right, in the next set of data that we're going to look at, we have days at the top and then a growth rate. And I kind of made this data as uh, the sunnier that it gets. All right, so the more days of sunshine per year, the faster the trees grow. And that's your theory, at least. What you want to do is see if these two numbers are correlated. So this type of chart is perfect for using to see the relationship of two pieces of data. All right, you can do it with three as well, which would be a bubble chart. What we're going to do is select this table. I made this one longer so that you can see kind of the value of uh, trying to project it a little bit better. Go to insert chart. I don't think it guesses the best chart to begin with. This one to me looks like it's showing historical data, kind of stock market data or maybe weather data. But if you want to make this look more like a projection, what you can do is choose scatter plot. And this is the actual pieces of data. And you might have to kind of squint your eyes, right? But what you can do is see there is a correlation with these. It's not perfect, right? But these are, these are all the real points where they lay on the graph. And then you can kind of draw imaginary line through them to see what's happening. If you hover over one of them, it will tell you what it is. And one thing that I really like about scatter charts is that you can add a trend line and that's your best projection where it's going to be. Now you can change the way that, that, that trend line curves, but in this case, I think that straight line is pretty appropriate. And that straight line makes sense because I made this series mathematically with a random ge number generator and I knew that they would kind of evenly deviate around this mean. All right, so that's showing data that correlates. I threw in one uh, last one here just for fun. Doesn't fit in any of the other types, but if you wanted to show something occurring over an area, so I have some data here and it varies based on what state you're in. And then it has some numerical values associated with each state. So if we see what the explore option brings up for this, it doesn't guess what I want to do. So explore can be handy, but in this case, let's close that. We'll go to insert chart. And we'll put this chart in the middle so you can see it. This is actually pretty nice the way it's showing it here. Um, but a fun type of chart that you can do is called a geo chart. So they're in the maps down here. And at first it thinks that you're talking about the whole world. Being Google, I would have thought it might've been smart enough to see that these are just states in the United States, but um, we can work our way through this. So what you can do when you come over to the left and you look at setup, let's go to customize and look at geo and let's tell it that the region that we want to work with is the United States. And there we go. It color coded these to indicate their density. You hover over each one, it will tell you the actual number. And if you look in the lower left-hand corner it will show you where that 
lies on that key. It's pretty cool. All right, so let's go more in depth with each of these charts and show you all the different options. And we'll start out showing you all the options with a pie chart. You've just come back from a trip. You did a survey of the types of trees on different sides of the mountain. And now for the best part, you get to put that data in a spreadsheet. In each one of these data sets, we're going to think of as a whole. And each of the types of trees is part of the whole. So we're going to create some charts and what you want to express with those charts is what portion of the whole is each one of these trees. So the first thing that we want to do is we're just going to start with one of these tables. And by the time we're done, we're going to be comparing all of them and walking through the different types of charts that you have available to do this. We're going to start with West facing and we'll just do insert a chart. And it's done a lot of the work for you already. It's chosen reasonable colors that have enough contrast. It's already labeled all the data points and it chose a header for you. So what we'll do at this point is we'll go through some customization just to show you what options you have available. And we'll start off just by changing the header because if you're going to present all four of these charts, they're all number of species. So Google Sheets made its best guess uh, what the title should be. You could just double click in here and change it, but we'll come over to the right because this is where all the options are. And we'll change this to West facing. For now, I think the best way to express this is a pie chart. But if we go to the setup tab, we can look at a few of the other options. You could do something as simple as making a donut chart. It's another type of dessert or a 3D pie chart. These all present the data in a very similar way. So we'll keep it on pie chart for now. But maybe it's important to you to present the number of trees instead of the percentage. So Sheets just guessed that you'd want to see that the sycamores were 15% of the whole. And all of these sets of data that we have, have a whole. So in this instance, 680 trees is the whole and sycamores are 15% of that. Well, let's say you wanted to present just how many sycamores that was instead of 15%. If you hover over each of the pieces of the pie, you can see that it shows you the amount and the percentage. And let's say that we want to show that amount on the slice of pie all the time. We'll come to the customize portion of the chart editor and we'll drop down pie chart. And the slice label, which is what goes in the inside of the pie, will change from none to value. So it still left the percentages on here, but we'll say that's all right. It's showing the values inside too. And one last thing before we move from looking at one chart to looking at four charts together is that of course we want to accentuate the oak trees. Here in this channel, we have an affinity for oak trees. So let's go to the pie slice, make sure it's on oak and we'll bump it out 25% from the center. The pie chart actually went over our legend here. So let's move that. We'll go to the legend and we'll move it to the left. All right, this is looking good. What we'll do, we're going to shrink this down because we want to represent all four sides of this mountain. This is the side that faces the west. And we want to insert charts for these other three tables, but we want them to be comparable. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're just going to copy this chart. So I'll do keyboard shortcuts of control C and then control V. And the reason why I chose to do it that way is so that it keeps all the same settings as the first chart. And then we can go into each one of these and then change the data range that it's looking at. So we'll do edit chart for the first one. The data range is here. We'll change that to the north facing table. Click OK. Automatically update your data and each tree is still represented by the same color. So since we customized the title, it didn't update that. We'll make sure we do that. And now on the chart of the trees that faces to the east, 
made a subtle change where I changed the order of the data to see what happens to the colors, make sure that they still match up. So we'll edit the range on this. Slide over to the right. Birch is still blue, but the red now is maple and oak is yellow. So did this on purpose as subtle things that you want to pay attention to if you have more than one chart is that you probably want the colors to represent the same things, right? And you can do that. So we'll go in and edit chart and we'll customize each pie slice where birch should still be blue. Maple on the other charts though was yellow. So we will change that back. I guess that's orange. Oak was red and sycamore was still green. We'll go to the last chart. So we changed out one of the trees and this one sadly does not have an oak tree, but with the color red and this being bumped out, it makes it look like it's still oak because it's using the same color. So what we'll do since the hemlocks only exist on the south facing slopes, we'll give that its own color. So the comparability is still here. When you look at the south facing, you see there's four different parts to the whole, but one of the parts, the hemlock, is different than what's in the other four charts. All right, so we have a pretty good representation here of what the composition is of all four sides of the hill. And then this brings us to a good point where we can illustrate another way to show parts of the whole, and that's with a line chart. So let's go back to the left. This is the same data that's above, but it's combined into one table because maybe it's easier to look at this data all in one chart, right? It's a preference. It depends what you're trying to do, but we will do insert chart and sheets as always tries to guess at what you want to do. And let's take a look at what it did. So in this case, we're trying to express what's found on each slope. So you want that to be the axis instead of the type of tree. So we'll come over to the right and we'll put a check mark and switch rows and columns. And that pretty quickly adjusted this chart so that it is showing that. And maybe this is a chart that you like. It does clearly show the different types of trees, but what it doesn't do is that it shows which portion of the whole these are. So if you want to represent each slope as a whole and then show what portion each tree is, we'll change column chart to a stacked column chart and it switched our axis again. Let's switch that back. So if you're also trying to convey the message of the number of trees on each slope, this is probably the right chart. But if all you're interested in is the proportion, so of each slope, what's the portion of each tree type, you can change the stacking from standard to 100%. So this shows the composition of each side of the slope better, as long as you're not trying to also show the total number of trees. Because if you are, this makes every face of the hill look the same, but really some of them had more trees than others. So there's different charts to express different things. This one definitely expresses the proportion of the different types of trees better. And if you turn the stacking back to standard, it conveys the portion as well as the total amount. The next thing that we're going to do with this data about different types of trees is to show what's called a whole to whole comparison and talk about the different types of charts that work for that. All right, so we're still on our tree surveying journey in the mountains of the Eastern United States. And we finished up in the last episode comparing some parts to a whole is how we phrased it. And that was when we were looking at data and comparing each number to the entire amount. So in that case, pie charts were helpful, but now we're going to move on. We'll go over to the right-hand side here. And the first piece of data that we're going to look at is we're comparing a series of numbers just to each other, not to the entire amount. So a pie chart is not what we're looking for anymore. We're gonna highlight this and we'll go to insert chart. We'll pull this down here. And the three types of charts that are going to be best for this kind of comparison are the column chart, the bar chart, which is just a column chart turned on its side, or the line chart. So we'll get into the line chart in a minute when we come down to this next table. But for now, let's do the column chart. Left click on that. And then it's mostly done for us. I'll make this a little bit larger. 
We'll make a few little tweaks here. The one thing is meters versus species is a horrible name. This is just tree height, right? So let's just change this. We'll double click on that, type in tree height. If you want to do any other customization, let's say that should be centered, right? You just have the selections right here. We'll make it a little bit larger. Okay, and let's do one more thing to make it look cool. The chart style will make it 3D so these columns will pop a little bit. Ooh, there we go. All right, so seeing that this is the same presentation where you just talked to people about the composition of these trees, and now you're talking to them about the relative heights, the colors should be the same. But we're not quite there yet. So this is for the whole series. So if we change the color here, it would change all of them. All right, so let's go back, put that back on auto. What we want to do is format the data point. So we'll, we'll double left click on this, make sure that Oak is selected. And that brought up format data point. If it doesn't come up at first, just make sure you double click on the specific one that you want. And we'll change this one to red. The maples were orange and the sycamores were green. And being able to compare charts is very important. So now when you come and you look at these heights, you can easily see that on the west facing slope, most of the trees are sycamores and those are about medium height when compared to these other four. All right, so that's a bar chart, pretty straightforward. Let's, let's put it back to 3D though, that looked better. There we go. All right, so your bar chart is done. We're going to move that out of the way and then talk about a little bit more complicated chart. As a matter of fact, I'm going to delete this chart. We're going to talk about a little bit more of a complicated scenario here where we have the height, but then we added in another series of data points for the circumference of the trees. And we want to see how these two series of data relate to each other. So we'll be displaying more information here on the same chart. So you have to be very careful that things don't get cluttered because that can happen quickly. So we'll select this table of data, and we'll do something a little bit different. We'll go left click the explore button, let Google Sheets do some of the thinking for us. When I left click on that, it has already suggested some types of charts. Since we already did a column chart, we'll come down and work on this line chart. So all you need to do is left click on it and drag it into your sheet. All right, so we will close the explore button and it has made life easier for us. It's made a pretty workable chart for us. We'll make it larger, but we have a problem here. And let's talk about that is that these are useful numbers, right? And they do show a comparison between themselves. But when you put them on the chart with the same axis as the height, it looks like they're all almost the same. So what we want to do is put each of these on their own axis, but the same chart so that you can really see the fluctuation in the circumference. So let's double left click on this to bring up the chart editor. I'm going to maximize this window to give us a little bit of space. And we want to edit the series. And down under axis, you have left axis, which would be uh, this vertical axis is the only one on there right now. Let's drop this down and look at a right axis. And in the series, instead of applying to all the series, let's just apply this to circumference. All right, so let's remember this is the one that we want to change the axis. And let's make this the right axis. So now that you're dealing with just circumference and you've said right axis, it's given it its own scale. And it knew that 10 was the maximum number, so it made that the maximum point. But let's do one more thing now that we're in here. The circumferences only go down to eight. Let's drop, let's go to the vertical axis. And when it just says vertical axis, you have to assume it's talking about the first one. So let's first change the height. So the minimum height is 62. So we'll make the minimum 50, leave the maximum where it is. And you already get a lot more movement in the blue line showing the height. But the circumference we need to stretch out to. So we'll go to the right vertical axis, expand that, and make that minimum value seven. Because it starts at eight, I don't want it touching the bottom. So you stretched out that scale as well. All right, so when you come back and look at the chart, 
you see now a clear correlation between these two. They tend to move in tandem, right? So as a tree gets taller, it needs to get thicker. But maybe the maple doesn't need to get quite as big around to support its height. Maybe this is made up data though, so who really knows? All right, and in this next video, if you come back and you repeat these measurements year after year, you start developing a time series. So we'll look at how to chart data over time. All right, we're going to continue our story of measuring different things about trees. And this time we're going to be measuring the change in the tree height over time. Okay, so we're saying that we took measurements for five years, four different tree types, and we want to see what this data means. Let's go to insert chart. And as usual, Google Sheets suggests the right chart. Okay, so there are other charts available. If you look at, let's say, column chart, for example. Well, right off the bat, this one is just arranged incorrectly. So let's just switch the rows and the columns. And now this is telling the story of the tree growth. But with a column chart, most of the emphasis is on each individual amount, not the change between the amounts. So it's a little bit harder to see the growth patterns, let's say, for example, of the birch. But if you switch back to the line chart, you can see the birch moving here and the lines, which are taking up most of the space, is the change between the two points. Now, if you feel like these lines are a little bit close together, let's just move this over to the right and stretch it out a little bit. And there you go. It's, it's even easier to follow that way. You typically want the passage of time on the X axis and the values on the Y axis. And then when you go from left to right, which is the way that we're conditioned to read, at least in the Western hemisphere, you'll see the changes as you move forward in time. Now, if you're doing this as part of a presentation where it's combined with other charts, you do want to take some time to make sure that the colors are the same. So in this case, let's just go to customize and series. And then if you need to change any colors, let's just say we want to change maple. You select that and you change the line color right here. All right, we'll assume that those are okay for now. But one thing that we do want to do is, probably don't want to call this birch, oak, maple, and sycamore. Let's just call it, let's just call it tree growth. And one thing that you want to spend a lot of time on is just making sure that it's as readable as possible. So another thing that you can do is smooth out the lines because as we talked about before, you're looking for the change between the two points. Well, it's not really a straight change, right? This should be a gradual change. So if we bring our chart editor back up, we'll go to customize. And in the chart style, if you place a check mark in smooth, it smooths out the lines. Now, another thing that you can do, and we will come back to this later when it makes more sense, is that you can insert a trend line. So if you left click on trend line, these lighter lines are showing the mean of the values. So it's putting in a trend to help you guess where it's going to be in the future. Right now that just makes too much to look at. All right, so let's scroll down to this series of data. And you had someone that's kind of newer take these measurements. So you're going to see that there's a little bit more randomness in them. So we'll go to insert chart. Google Sheets knows to take this entire range just because I've selected at least one active cell in this range of data, right? And I guess that we wanted a line chart, but in this case, we're actually gonna go with something a little bit different. Uh, but first we're gonna come in and change the name. We'll say Birch Growth. So if you look at this, this looks, it looks kind of like a heartbeat, frankly, and it will lead you to assume that the growth in a birch kind of goes up and down, but trees don't get smaller, right? They only get bigger. So we want to illustrate this in a different way. We're not going to use a line chart, so we will go to Setup, drop down Line Chart, and come down and pick a Scatter Chart. So we'll left click on Scatter Chart, and we'll make this a little bit bigger. We're trying to show you a little bit better what all these measurements mean without overemphasizing each measurement. And we're trying to de-emphasize the fluctuation between these points. So now let's go back to the trend line that we talked about earlier. Wasn't making sense when we looked at it at first, but if we left click on trend line, 
Now you can see why you might want to do that. All right, so it cuts through all the noise and it tells you where the next dot is most likely to be. At least that's how I like to think about what it's doing. Now there are some different things that you can do with this trend line. Let's stretch this out a little bit more just so we can see the variations as we go through this. Right now it's a linear line, so it's going to put a straight line into here in the best way that it can fit it. But that may not actually be what's happening with the data, so let's do something I think is a little bit better, which would be a moving average. And then this will move with the data, but it should move less than the data. It should smooth it out. Uh, but it's still too jagged, right? So let's change the number of periods that it's using to calculate the moving average. And we'll just go through four, it gets a little bit smoother. And we'll look at six, and it gets a lot smoother. Right, so let's use that. And then this is shifted forward a little bit, so let's uh, change it from trailing to centered. All right, so this is intended to draw the viewer to what is most likely the average. And I think this line is helping us to do that. All right, so let's do one last thing that's kind of fun. It's a little bit of an addition to charts, but it's a natural extension because if you look at this, maybe what you're trying to do is project what the growth is going to be in the future. So let's do that with a function. And we will uh, go to the end of our data. And what we'll do, let's just say we're looking over the next several days, all right? So I'm going to highlight February 1st to February 8th. I'll go into the lower right-hand corner of that until the mouse turns into a plus sign, which means I can drag this down and just kind of put new values in there. It recognizes the pattern and it puts new dates. Now you'll notice it just redid the chart, but that's just because I have some of these values coming in here uh, by using the random function. And that can recalculate what a random number is when you change things. So uh, don't let that throw you off too much. But we are going to predict some numbers here. So we're going to look into the future and we're going to use a function called trend. And the help comes up and says, if you give it partial data, which is the historical data here, it's going to put new data out there in an ideal trend. All right, so what all this fancy wording is telling you is that it's going to use the previous values to predict future values. All right, so the first thing that it needs is a known Y data. So if you look at this graph, the Y axis is the height. So we will select this historical data of the heights because uh, that's what's known. So that's what this function needs. And then it needs the corresponding Y values. So what dates do those heights belong to? We'll select that area as well. We'll hit a comma. And now it wants to know, well, pretty much in this case, what dates do you want me to predict this for? Okay, so it's calling that new data X, but it's saying, what days do you want me to predict in this situation? So let's highlight C82 to C89. And then just let's put in a true for the last value. Reading what that says down there uh, gives me a headache. So just make it true. And there we go. So there's a prediction of these values given all the previous values. All right, so let's look at the chart. And I think we need to refresh this chart a little bit because it didn't pick those up. So we'll go to edit. Let's go down and look at the range. It at now ends in 89. We will edit this chart and make sure the range goes all the way down to 89 now. Click out of there and there's these new lines. So you can see now they're just based on mathematical prediction because they don't vary from the mean anymore. So is that exactly what's gonna happen? No, of course not, right? There's going to be some variability in it, but this is the mathematical best guess. All right, now we're going to look at mapping geographical data using the built-in charts in Google Sheets. All right, if you're using Google Sheets and you have some location data in your spreadsheet and you wanna see how that looks on a map, we're going to go over something called geocharts, how to use them and some alternatives because they have some limitations. All right, so let's get started. So we have some example data right here and there's a few things to notice about this. One is that it's only two columns. So you have a column of data with the location and a column of data with one data point. All right, and that's all you can have in these geo charts. So that's what you want to start with. And the other aspect is that these locations are nice and clean. So these are the exact names of these countries. So we will select this entire table 
and we'll go to insert chart. So a geo chart is just another type of chart, but Google Sheets doesn't guess at first that that's what you want. So it started with a pie chart. Let me tuck my data in here a little bit so we're not overlapping. All right, so let's change this pie chart. We'll scroll down. There's two selections under map. We'll take a look at them both, but first we'll do geo chart. And this did map the data. It's not smart enough though to start with the right region. So it always starts with the entire world, but I only use countries in Africa. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go to customize and then drop down the geo selection. And instead of world, we'll pick Africa. Now this is as zoomed in as you can get. All right. So the smallest region in which we can map these countries in Africa is the entire continent. And in this case, we're doing maximum elevation. So we want the largest numbers probably to appear red. I know it just makes more sense that way, more extreme, you want it red, right? So we will go and edit this chart, customize in geo, and let's change the minimum to green and the maximum to red. All right, and then you can pick a mid color as well. So we have red here, and green. So let's just sort of go in the middle of these two and pick a yellow. And then when you look at these, this is probably apparent that the highest peak is in Rwanda, if you look closely, followed by South Africa. And apparently Senegal is pretty flat. Who would have known? So let's go back to setup and talk about what's happening here. So your data range here was automatically selected and that happened because I happened to be in any active cell in this continuous range of data. Okay, so Google Sheets was smart enough to figure that out. I didn't have to change that. The region, it is asking what range to pick up. So in this case, it's called country. That's why it's saying that there. And then the color is based on the maximum elevation. Now there were only two columns here to begin with. So it picked those up relatively easily. Next, we'll move into a more complex example and we'll go to the worksheet called states. And this doesn't look complex at first, right? And if you had this data, so this is a city, state, and the population, I think at first, at least I would think to highlight the entire amount and go to insert chart. Let me move this over a little bit. Bring the editor back up. And let's go back to geo chart, but this time we're going to go to a geo chart with markers. And we'll talk about that but the first thing that you'll notice is a couple things going on wrong here. One is it wasn't able to figure out that these were all in New York. So it brought me to just the entire world again. It's not th that big of a deal. It'll just go back to customize and it's not even letting me change the location is because it's not reading these right. So we had talked in the beginning about how the location should be in one column. So what we'll do here, we're going to insert a column to the left of the population and we'll call it city comma state. And we'll join two cells together. So we want to join D8 and use the ampersand. And then we want to put a comma and a space. So I just type those in. We'll close that off with a quote because that part was just a text string. Do the ampersand again. And we're going to reference E8 hit enter and then you have these new values here that are just kind of a addition if you will it added these two cells together but it knows that they're text so it just displayed atoms and then new york all right and now google sheets is smart enough where it says ah, i think you probably want to extend this function all the way down to the end of the data so i'm going to hit the check mark because that's a good guess they're right and now i have one column for the location and one column for the data, so let's try to map this. I'm going to hit delete on this geo chart and we will insert another chart. Go down to the geo chart with markers. And you can see it's working better. It's still at the wrong zoom level, but it's all in New York. So let's hide these two columns. Move this chart over just a little bit. And then we'll go into the upper right-hand corner and choose Edit Chart. Now let's go to Customize. We'll go to Geo and we'll say not the world, right? 
we're going to go North America is the next step down right after world, but we want to be more specific and do United States. All right, so we can't zoom any closer than that. And we'll come in later and talk about a possible solution to that. But for now, we're going to talk about what the markers means. So as you can see relatively easily, the markers are sized according to the underlying numbers. And when you hover over them, you get these little tags. So that's handy. Adams, New York has a population of 5,000. I didn't talk about what this data was. So this second column is just population size. All right, got that off the great Wikipedia. We're going to assume it's right for purposes of what we're doing. Um, but these markers give us a little more visual information. So if we were to switch this back to the other type of geo chart, it wouldn't tell us as much, right? Because the only region that it works with here is a state. All those points are in the same state, so it's all green. So in this case, the geo chart with markers can be more specific. So you can also show this as pins on a map. And then when you hover over the pins and then you can zoom in to just New York, but hold on to that thought. We're going to do that in a minute. Let's switch next to a larger data set. And I called the worksheet large data set. Very helpful. And if I scroll down, so this is just a lot of lines on purpose and they'd really clutter up the map. So let's say that you want to still aggregate data here and look at it by state, right? But you have too many lines. So what you can do in this case is you could just insert a pivot table. So we'll go to a blank space on the worksheet and I'll link right now in the upper right hand corner to a primer on pivot tables. If you're not familiar with them, you can watch that and uh, learn how to use them. They are super handy. But for this video, we're just going to put one in and assume you know how to use it. So we'll go to data pivot table and we're going to select our data range here of the states with the associated data. We're going to put the pivot table on this sheet. We'll go up and put it in G3, click OK. All right, so we're going to create this pivot table and back again to what we talked about before, we want only two columns. In this case, we want to see this by state and we want to see the amounts by state. So first in this pivot table, let's add values. And the values that we want is the amount field. All right, so that's adding all of the amounts together. And now we want to aggregate those by state. So the rows that we're going to put in, we'll say rows and state. <laughs> and I have to fix some data formatting there apparently, but this will break the amounts down by state. Let me grab this format, use the format painter. Don't know how that happened. Maybe I used this sheet for something else and had some formatting applied there. Uh, but those numbers were being displayed as dates when I really wanted them showing as numbers. So we fixed that. And now that you've aggregated this data, all right, and you have it in two nice clean columns and you can put that on a map. We'll throw it on a map real quick. And then we'll talk about how to maybe put it in a more useful map. So for now we'll do insert chart we will choose just a regular map I'm going to train it as to what region we're talking about united states and there's the data so you'll notice here that the range really isn't very effective because everything almost everything looks red and then one poor little green here. So what's happening, I think, is that that green, oh, so we are picking up the sum of that table. So that's way outside the bounds. Let's just go back to the table and clip the range to H50. Get back out of there, there. That makes it much better. All right, so if you have data that just neatly covers one region, GeoChart may do everything that you need. So let's go back to this second worksheet. And here we have data that just doesn't work very well in this geo chart, right? Because you want to zoom further in. So an alternative that we can do, let me get out of full screen mode here and we're going to go to my maps. And this is where you can create your own map. So let's left click on create map. It's untitled map. So we will call this New York locations. 
go save and my maps has the option to left click on import and look for recent and here's the geo data this is the spreadsheet we're working on but it only looks in the first worksheet so let's go back to where we were we were going to grab these states we're going to slide that over to the left and the other thing that we want to do is I'm going to take the city and state. I'm going to paste them as values because they were there as a formula before. So I'm going to paste them as values. We'll get rid of the city and state and all of these empty columns. And we're going to push it up in the very upper left hand corner. All right, so that should work well. We'll go back to my maps. We'll go back to import, pick the geodata, select it, and then it sees the two columns. Oh, so it's asking us what column has the position, All right? So it's not smart enough to know that it's just the one called city state. So we will check that one. It could be more than one column in this case, but we had already put it into just one. We'll continue. And then it's asking us for a column that has the title for the place marks. So if you know you're going to be using my maps, you can plan this for more than one column. So you could come back here and you could add whatever you wanted in these subsequent columns. But for now, we'll just name them with the city and the state. We'll click finish. And then it automatically brings in your data from Google Sheets. It puts it where it belongs on the map and, and zooms to the right region. So this is very different from a geo chart. It's not showing how your data relates to each other as far as the amounts go. But if you hover over one of them, left click on it, it will show you the amount right there. So this is handy for seeing where things happen, but if you wanna see what, you may wanna stick with the geo chart. You could come in here and you could change the color of the pins and the icons. And you can also add more data if you want or put pictures in here. All right, so this is more just making a custom map and what we went over before is really charting the amounts on a map. All right, in this next video, we're going to show you in Google Sheets how to automate your work where you can record all the steps that you do if you're doing the same thing every day. Next time you go in there, press a button, it gets done for you. And I hope to see you in that video and thanks for watching.